what is going on we're back from our sabbatical it is may 6th 2016 as always a ton to talk about uh man we missed this whole connor mcgregor dana white scuff up he and nate diaz are off the ufc 200 card and we got a rematch between daniel cormier and john jones we'll briefly talk about all that craziness now it's sounding like that conor mcgregor and nate diaz will fight on ufc 202 we'll talk a little bit about that the card between 201 we have a fight between robbie lawler and tyron woodley of course this weekend we have a card in rotterdam netherlands we'll talk about thanks for tuning into the show let's do it to the MMA Podcast. <laughs> and once again, thanks to Lenny Hart for that drop. Thanks to uh, Eddie Bravo and his band Smoke Serpent, who before we did episode one, actually, I I, I tweeted him and asked if, if, if we could use that song as an intro. He said yes, so we got formal permission from Smoke Serpent to use that song Jiu Jitsu as the intro. As always, check out all of their music. Check out our website, themmapodcast.com. Uh, joined today by the ever lovely P Money on Twitter at Sweet Pappy Jones. What's going on, bud? Yes, Jake. I'm more excited than I've ever been to do the MMA podcast. Uh, really just, damn that's that's a high that's, benchmark more excited like oh, more excited than ever wow more excited than ever our pre ufc 196 vegas podcast i'm probably more excited than that just by virtue of the fact we have been out for so long it's been it's been a few weeks and we're we're here to finally give the people what they need I'm I'm quite pleased. We do have a lot to talk about, and uh, good to be back with you. That's been too long. I don't know if it's 166, 167. I do know uh, it is May 6th, and like I said, we have a lot to talk about. We are doing it live on Ustream, so if you are listening live, you can call in at 213-457-3380 or Skype us at The MMA Podcast. Visit TheMMAPodcast.com and click the links at the top to subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. All for free. Free 99? The low, low. All right. Um, shit. Let's get, get into uh, the Conor McGregor news. Um, it all started with a tweet at 12.29 p.m. Eastern on April 19th, where out of nowhere, Conor McGregor tweets, I have decided to retire young. Thanks for the cheese. Catch you later. And everybody's head exploded because we're like, what the fuck? The biggest star in the sport, like your two biggest stars, Ronda seems to have imploded. We'll talk talk about that uh, that bit. I don't don't know if, uh, if if it's gossip news or what, but it's a pretty funny story. Misha Tate told about her and Paige Van Zant yesterday on the Joe Rogan podcast. We'll t- touch on that a little later on in the show. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, Connor, the biggest star in the sport, retires, and you're like, huh? And Hel- Helwani tweets, like, this isn't a hoax. This is very serious. Kavanaugh tweets, no, like, he's he's retired. Uh, you have, you know, like, small things, like, Gunnar Nelson's dad is at dinner with him and, like, takes a picture of Connor and Gunnar and is like, hey, it's one retired fighter and one current fighter. Like, all this stuff pointing to... Connor retiring and we were going to do a show that night actually and uh that was the reason we we had a little time time off um a a a few tech issues 
plus some scheduling issues. Your boy P P Money works six days a week, and I was going through. Uh, if you do listen to the show, you'll know uh, I'm in law school, and I had two weeks of finals that were pretty intensive. But uh, I'm over that now. The tech issue is solved, and we do plan on keeping uh, the, the the train rolling and doing it weekly. We do apologize for that time we had off, but I almost want to say it was a good thing because it seemed like every day the story changed first we were wondering if connor was retiring then we see it's like a pissing match then we don't know if the fight is on or off for ufc 200 then connor like sends out a faux tweet like oh congrats to dana and lorenzo for getting me and nate back on the the card which you know it seemed like toward the end of all of it connor uh, didn't want to retire, and you know he had had this brilliant uh, long post. I won't re read it all on Facebook, where he basically said, you know, enough with all this media shit. I don't want to do media. I want to train. Last time I wasn't adequately pre uh, prepared, and I just want to be ready for Nate, a bigger man. You know, blah 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 blah, and said, you know, for purposes of the UFC and USADA, etc., I am not retired. And it seemed like toward the end he wanted to get back on the card, but uh, Dana and Lorenzo just wouldn't budge. You know, they uh, drew that line in in the sand and wouldn't cross it. Um, you know, we had had this big presser where like Ariel's asking Dana, so if Connor wants it and Nate wants it and the fans want it, why don't you just make the fight? And Dana's response: Next question. And Dana was using this line of reasoning, like, it's not fair to other fighters if we let Connor skip out on media. And Ariel had another pretty good good line. Well, life isn't fair. I was told that once as as, as a kid. Nate and Ariel really uh, were, were, were the MVPs of that presser. Uh, Ariel, for the reasons I just said, uh, Diaz um, was told that Conor, Conor McGregor was tweeting during the presser and had had this um, one of his... Hey, one uh, more for you, and this might sound like a weird lines. question, but Conor just tweeted something that makes it seem like that he's at least watching this press conference. You got anything to say to him if he's watching? What did he tweet? <laughs> He tweeted something to the effect of he respects everybody making it out here, but no one on the stage made the company $400 million in the last eight months or something like that. Connor got his ass beat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, and, 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 and the crowd played into it too, uh, cheering on Nate. Um, so Connor gets pulled from UFC 200 and, uh, as early as today, it sounds like, uh, Jeremy Botter of Flow Sports, Flow Combat, uh, saying that, uh, that fight is likely going to be at UFC 202. Um, Botter says he's not sure what the UFC 202 location would be, but if I had to guess, just because of the frequency of fights that the UFC has been doing in Vegas, and, uh, and they're probably wanting to make the Connor fight in Vegas, because all the Irishmen love to go to Vegas, I would guess it would be in Vegas, um, but I mean, shit, it could, you know, the... The Irish can fly to other cities too, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, Pat have been ran and just trying to sort of set the table as well as I could. Um, well, what did you make of like just it? It was entertaining at first, but I think a lot of fans started to grow weary of it when you have this pissing contest between a billionaire and a millionaire, and all the fans are just like, I, I just want to see a fight, you know, like, stop, you know, come the fuck on. Yeah, um, well, and like you said, I guess it is a good thing that we did not do the show that very night, because there, there are a lot of... Uh, layers to the story as we found out and 
really, to me, I think the, the most interesting thing is that, you know, Connor removed himself from this fight. And then he's begging, oh, he wants back on. He wants back on. And he's taking um, he's taking issue with his PR schedule. I mean, this is the guy. Yeah, he's talking about how much money he made the company over uh, the last eight months. Well, and you made that through your PR work. That is why you've ingratiated yourself to the UFC and why you've gotten yourself to the level you're at now. So now, for the first time after he's coming off a loss in the UFC, and now he's saying he wants to scale back the training, he wants to, you know, or he wants to scale back the PR. He just wants to focus on the training. And it's, it's, you know, that's not what got you to where you're at. I mean, understandably, now that he's uh, got a loss, he wants to go back to the drawing board and focus on the fundamentals. I really just think this comes down to the fact that he shouldn't have fought Nate Diaz at 170 pounds. The rematch shouldn't be at 170 pounds. And, um, you know, now... He's just he he wants to buy his time and he wants to rethink his strategy and make sure he's good to go for that rematch when when it does happen. Um, but you know, I, I certainly while one side of me does say, yeah, you know, hey, he he should be able to train for his fight again though. That's when he was going to fight Jose Aldo, Rafael dos Anjos, when he was going to fight two uh, to to be become a two division champion you know you didn't hear him talking about hey you know what guys i'm gonna go be a two division champ here i'm really you know i'm going for the big one maybe we should scale back the media just a bit maybe you know i could do some skype stuff on ufc tonight or something like that there there wasn't any of that um so i don't know he he kind of set this own standard for himself to live up to and um yeah, I don't know. I, I don't feel too bad that he was pulled from UFC 200. And really, I think the card even looks better afterwards. I mean, that was with Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor as a headliner. For some reason, it just it just didn't feel right. There was an interim title fight below that. And the only reason the interim title fight was happening was because Conor McGregor was taking a second fight at 170 pounds before defending his featherweight title. And now I think it looks better. We've got the undisputed light heavyweight championship fight, the undisputed women's bantamweight fight. Um, and for some reason, that, that interim title fight doesn't look too bad right now. And then you got the whole card on top of it. I think it's, it's an improvement to UFC 200. Um, and yeah, it's, it's certainly been uh, quite the interesting debacle to, to watch unfold. But um Really, I, I haven't, uh, you know, and, and I, I typically always err on the side of the fighters. I, I typically side with them uh, in these situations. But this just happens to be one where um, I, I would happen to uh, agree with Dana White and company. You know, you've got all the fighters there, all the fighters doing it. This is what Connor normally does. Um, you know, should have been able to just uh, tough it out and, and make it happen for this guard. Yeah, um, and I think I agree with both sides in a way. I do, you know, Dana. Dana should have the right to call all the, all the fighters to to a presser if it's you know only once in like every couple months. I mean, if this is your full time job, having to travel every couple months is part of the gig. Um, I do agree with Connor though that come fight week and maybe week before. Maybe the UFC does overburden their big stars with media leading up to fights. Because I remember leading up to Conor's last fight, he was every day doing like Kimmel or Conan or, you know, morning shows and this and that. Fight week, I think the UFC needs to realize that this is, uh, this is already a really busy and stressful time for fighters. Maybe sort of have a media week, I don't know, a couple weeks beforehand and let the fighter on fight fight week have that time because I I couldn't imagine having the media workload like Connor has and having to take care of all the things you have to take care of on 
fight week, including your weight, traveling, if you're bringing other folks along, you know, just the, the you know, juggling of going on a long trip, packing all of your gear, cutting weight, making weight, the guy you're fighting, you know, I, I haven't even mentioned the mind frame you have to be in to fight in front of a million people. Um, I'm sure it can be very overwhelming. Um, a story came out today about Connor and Floyd having a uh, boxing fight. I don't even. I. I. I'm not even going to spend any time on the topic, honestly, because uh, as Ariel confirmed, and I think a lot of people suspected, it's it's just nonsense. Um, Floyd isn't gonna fight Connor because Connor can make a lot more money fighting in the UFC, and Floyd can make a lot more money fighting the winner of this Canelo Amir Khan fight. Um, and I think that's what will go down with uh, Floyd. I think we see Floyd Canelo 2 uh, after Canelo beats the brakes off Amir Khan. Amir Khan, who actually said uh, might be thinking about a MMA c career. So he's, I think, already accepted the loss and is uh, thinking past this, this fight. But... Uh, that would be fun to uh, see, um, you know, another Eng Englishman who can't wrestle come to the UFC and get fucked up. Um, all right, past all of that, uh, all of the Connor stuff. Connor, Nate, probably at UFC 202. No announced location yet, but it would be on August 20th. Um,. Okay, what's next? Um, oh yeah, we had a few fights made in the last few weeks. One of which being uh, on the UFC 200 Fight Week docket, but not on that specific card. Uh, actually, a title fight on the UFC Fight Pass card on Thursday. The first of three events Thursday. Uh, you'll have this fight, Rafael Dos Anjos and Eddie Alvarez for the lightweight strap. Friday night, you have the tough finale uh, and Joanna versus Gedalia. And then UFC 200. You have that card with Jones Cormier, Aldo Edgar. Um, a few other fun fights there. Um, but yeah, RDA versus Eddie Alvarez. This is going to be a fun fight. I think um, I looked at odds, and I think the last time I checked, Vegas thought that um, Dos Anjos was a pretty sizable favorite, but. I like Eddie's chances here. He's his his wrestling has looked really good. He's he's recently done a really really expert job of just snuffing out you know new, neutralizing a fighter's best attributes. Um, yeah, here are. RDA is coming in minus four hundred. Eddie Alvarez plus three twenty five. Um, I'm probably going to still end up picking Dos Anjos once the time comes. Um, I could, could switch, but, uh, man, he has looked so dominant in all of his fights. Um, I just, uh, I don't see that changing. I mean, the, the only person I think I would pick over Rafael Dos Anjos at, at 155 right now is Nurmagomedov. And we may end up seeing that that fight soon. Um, who are you picking in this fight? Well, you know, styles make fights, as they say, and as we say frequently. And I think Eddie Alvarez, he does have a good skill set for Rafael Dos Anjos. He's got uh, strong wrestling. Um, he may be able to keep it on the feet. Of course, Dos Anjos is just a, a bulldozer of a grappler. Super strong, super high-level uh, black belt. Um, but Alvarez is, is no slouch. And really while Rafael Dos Anjos, there was a time where he was, you know, top 15 at best in the UFC. He was the guy that got his jaw broken by Clay Guida and Eddie Alvarez was being talked about as the best talent, not in the UFC, you know, him and Gilbert Melendez for a long time, the two best 155 pound fighters, not in the UFC. Um, I want to say both fairly unanimously top 10 ranked in the um, overall MMA standings. And if now not Alvarez. Top five. Yeah, if not top five, easily both top 10. Um, 
and now they're both in the UFC. And you know, Alvarez, he's uh, he's he's done fairly well for himself. He did have the the rough hello with the cowboy fight. That was not the warmest welcome to the UFC for him, but um, he's done well since then. And uh, Rafael dos Anjos, he's uh, you know, he won't have the kind of uh, size disadvantage that he did against Cowboy Cerrone. They're they're very more evenly matched physically, and I think that could be a big factor in this fight. Alvarez uh, does have some crisp boxing. He does have some questionable striking defense, though. Anybody who knows Eddie Alvarez and has watched his fights knows that he typically gets dropped at some point in one of his fights. I I can't recall if Pettis dropped him in their encounter, but that, that really is his MO is typically you'll see him get clipped in a fight. Um, but always recovers and more often than not, he wins these fights too. So, um, if he comes in with the striking defense on point and if his wrestling is enough to keep Rafael Dos Anjos from, from grappling him up, man, I think we got a close fight here. Um, I do believe that Dos Anjos as the champion does deserve to be favorite. I don't know if I completely agree with the size of the line. It's it's not too bad, though. I, I suppose I'd say it's pretty close. I'd probably put Dos Anjos at maybe a minus 300, something like that. Um, but it's, it's a fairly solid line. Um, but I think Alvarez is a live dog in this. He, he really is a, a top-tier talent at 155 pounds, I believe. And... Um, yeah, I think uh, I think he's he's got a, a coin flip of a chance in this one. I'm I'm saying this is a 50 50. Um, if if I'm forced to pick, forced to bet, um, yeah, I would probably say my money is on Dos Anjos, but uh, uh, we're a little ways out from that fight. I don't know. I I I would not be shocked at Alvarez upset in this one. And this uh, card is actually filled out quite nicely. You know, it's the first of three cards in Vegas. Uh, you also have Joseph Duffy against Mitch Clark. Underrated fight at 55. Uh, Roy Nelson versus Derek Lewis. How fun is that fight going to be? Two absolute bangers. You have Big Country taking on the Black Beast. Um... That Friday card, like I'm, like I said, is gonna have Yin Jacek and Gedalia. Um, a few other fun fights. You got Jake Matthews on the card. Uh, Korean Superboy Duho Choi is taking on Tiago Tavares. Ross Pearson versus James Kraus. And then that UFC 200 card. Uh, Man, it's uh, it's gotten a lot of flack because of all the Connor stuff, but it's gonna be a fun ass fight, man. Aldo Edgar, Tate Nunez, uh, Velasquez Brown, Hendricks Gastelum, Cormier DC, Gegard Brunson, Sanchez Lauzon. Like that fight on its own is. I would usually say it would be fight of the night, but there are so many bangers on this card. Uh, pardon me, I don't know. Um, you got Kat Zingano against Julie Pena. I mean, this is this is shaped up to be the greatest card of all time. And they've always sort of upped the uh, Annie. You know, they did it for UFC 100. They did it for uh, that last July 4th card that we were in town for, UFC 189. And they've done it again, UFC 200. That's going to be a uh, hell, hell of a card. But, you know, I want to talk about one thing I think that got lost in all this. Um, all the Connor stuff and, you know... The, the Jones stuff and Cormier gets injured and Jones fights OSP and the rematch with Cormier is put on UFC 200. We don't know if GSP is going to come come back. Rumors are, are floating around about this. I think something that, that got lost in all of this was the main event announcement for UFC 201, July 30th in Atlanta, Georgia at the Phillips Arena. Uh, we got a welterweight championship between Robbie Lawler and Tyron Woodley that I haven't heard anyone talking about. Um, last time I checked, both of these fighters 
are absolute fucking headbusters, man. Robbie Lawler and Tyron Woodley throw with such aggression and in their last few fights have both been such absolute savages. Um, and both of them always willing to exchange. Dude, this is going to be such a fun fight, man. Oh, yes. Robbie Lawler versus Tyron Woodley. Uh, that fight has me so jacked up. Uh, I, I couldn't even figure out how to operate my my uh, smartphone here. That is just going to be <laughs> such a, a dynamic scrap. I mean, I think a Tyron Woodley, when Tyron Woodley is, is on his game, I mean, think of Tyron in the Carlos Condit fight. The way he was pushing around Carlos Condit, beating him up. I mean, um, sure, the injury was a huge part of, of the ending of that fight. But I think Tyron just absolutely stomping Condit really, <laughs> I mean, that that und undeniably led up to that injury. I mean, he was just, he was putting it on Carlos Condit like nobody ever had before. And, of course... We all know MMA math is is a is a tricky thing. Um, you know, you look at what a close fight Condit and Lawler had with Lawler uh, or uh, or with Condit. I'm sorry, uh, arguably should have won that fight and uh, been the champion right now. And you say, okay, well, you know, maybe Tyron has what it takes because he beat the guy that beat the guy. Um, and you never know. He's he's super quick, super dynamic, um, and just good everywhere. He's got the good grappling base. Um, him and Robbie Lawler are, are very similar. Robbie Lawler also, we've seen, you know, his striking has come so far. He's really mixing it up well. I want to say he uses the knees and kicks maybe just a little bit more than Tyron. Tyron um, typically, typically likes to box. Um, Although he does have some some heavy kicks when he does throw them, um, I want to say Lawler should enjoy a little bit of a size, a little height and reach advantage on Tyron. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they stack up standing next to each other uh, come way in time. But yeah, this this fight, oh my goodness, um, it's it's unfortunate. I tell you what, I would not have minded. If this were the UFC 200 mainliner or main uh, main event over Jones Cormier, just because I re I mean Robbie Lawler, pretty much any Robbie Lawler fight, that's just going to be guaranteed fireworks. But him versus Tyron Woodley, oh my goodness, um, that's it's it's going to be an epic fight. And you're right, you know I I uh, I'm surprised that's really not gotten a lot of traction. The announcement. Um, I mean, I guess just being a fight week itself um, with a card to break down this coming weekend and then that being after the three fight card international fight week, um, I guess I could see how it can get lost in the shuffle, but it hasn't been that busy of an MMA news week. So anyways, we're talking about it. We're fucking stoked about it. Um, yeah, that's, that's going to be. Ooh, that is going to be a dandy of a fight. Easily a uh, fight of the year candidate. And I'm trying to think how I'm going to pick this fight. I mean, by all, all, uh, all accounts, I should be picking Robbie Lawler here. Lawler uh, just has, has been absolutely crazy as a champ. Has, I mean, that, that fight against Rory was maybe the greatest fight of all time. Hell of a match, but one thing I notice, um, Robbie Lawler gets hit a lot. He gets tagged a bunch, and you can get tagged a bunch by a lot of fighters. I don't think you can get tagged a bunch by Woodley, so I'm gonna get going to, uh, you know, my, my picks as all of them are subject to change, but right now I think I'm going with the underdog. I don't think there is an official line posted yet in Vegas, but uh, just just the fact that Robbie seems to get hit a lot and Woodley throws with such crushing power, um, I think my preliminary pick is going to be for the chosen one, Tyron Woodley. Uh, who are you taking? 
Man, well, you know, um, truth be told, I, I might kind of be leaning towards uh, the chosen one myself. I mean, uh, for all the reasons you listed and more, I mean, you know, styles do make fights. And um, I I think, you know, Tyron, he might just be a little quicker. And as you mentioned, yeah, the, the striking defense. Um, although I suppose you could say, hey, you know, I mean, we saw – Tyron Woodley get knocked out by Nate Marquardt in Strike Force just a couple of years ago. Um, you could you could question. I mean, Robbie Lawler again. You know, to to play devil's advocate, I suppose that is another guy you do not want to get hit by. Both of these guys, the power we're talking about here, the power these fuckers are packing. Um, you take a shot from either one of them. I think really. Either guy could put the either guy out at, at any moment. Um, but Tyron might just be a little quicker and generate more power through that speed. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, I think that could that could be Robbie Lawler's undoing. Certainly Robbie Lawler's success in all of his victories since his return to the UFC have been squarely on his striking skills and his grappling has been used primarily just to keep the fight standing on the feet. Um, I don't see any reason that Robbie would change that strategy going into this fight. So, I mean, just being a standing battle, man, this, this is anybody's fight, but I think, uh, I think Tyron may, may have an edge here. Just, uh, just may be able to pull off the upset. Yeah, I um I think Lawler is the better striker, but Woodley hits so hard and Lawler leaves that chin open so much. I don't know. Um <clears throat> All right, final fight announcement before we get to uh UFC gossip news and of course UFC Rotterdam this Sunday's card. Um, Rumble Johnson and Glover Teixeira set as the co-main event in Chicago. My, uh, buddy Ross Finkelstein on Twitter, E before the L, he, uh, mentioned he would have rather seen this as the main event instead of Holm versus Shevchenko. I can see why they've put Holm in the main event spot, maybe because, you know, they're priming her for a fight against Rousey. And maybe because she was just the champion and Rumble hasn't been champion yet. Um, I I do agree that this probably should be the main event. I think it has more Im- implications for, for the division. Where Holm Chevchenko, the winners by no mean... The winner by no means is uh, going to gonna get, you know, a title shot. I I'm I think it's pretty safe to say the winner of Rumble versus Glover is going to get a title shot, um, especially if it's Rumble. I mean, you really can't argue that this will be Rumble's last last stop before getting another title shot, um, and uh, they they will be thrown down in Chicago. I believe this card is July twenty third, and it will be on Fox. Uh, UFC on Fox 20. Um, as far as picking it, uh, I think it's kind of an easy pick for me. I'm taking Rumble. Um, I think, you know, Glover's got a chance, but Glover just seems to do real well against fighters. He can overpower and march forward and throw that same combo. He always throws over and over and over. And when he gets back down by a striker who can throw them that's when he loses fights and i think that's exactly what rumble's gonna do i think uh on on paper it's a lot closer than it is in reality i think in reality uh rumble's just gonna steamroll him and that'll be that what do you think i could easily see it playing out like that jake but glover has just proven me wrong more and more lately and uh, with his performance against Rashad Evans, I mean, who knows if that was just Rashad not looking so good, more so than Glover looking really good. But Glover has managed to put together a nice little string of wins. And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, the only fight that I recall him losing was 
Um, the John Jones fight, to my recollection, that's probably his only loss in his last, I don't even know, I, I don't have his record in front of me, but maybe his last 8 to 10 fights, that's probably his only loss. Um, so he, he certainly, you can't really count him out against anybody. He is a beast, and we have seen Anthony Johnson, and speaking of, of beasts and guys who have just looked better and better over the years and over their last performances, um, Anthony Johnson, the one thing that has been that has been the thorn in his side is the grappling game. And sure, Glover to share, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think right off the top could be the guy to out grapple him, but hey, you never know. I mean, he could just shoot in and I mean they're they're both very big, very strong guys. And I mean if if you get low and keep that center of gravity low. Who knows? Maybe maybe Glover starts to work that wrestling game and starts to get the takedowns going just to frustrate Anthony Johnson and try to keep him off his game. I mean, really, that would be the smart game plan. I mean, I think that is the Anthony Johnson game plan. Um, just will Glover go in there and implement it? Because if he's if he wants to stand with Anthony Johnson, I certainly think that's the incorrect move, and he will be thoroughly destroyed um because anthony johnson that's that's his mo he has just been absolutely massacring these light heavyweights and finishing them with authority uh um it's it's really been great to see i mean even his fight versus phil davis oh my goodness that he didn't get the finish in that one but that was just an, an epic beatdown displayed great takedown defense throughout the whole fight. I mean, he's he's looked really great himself. Um, I see ways for both fighters to win this one, though. I definitely think I'm rolling with Anthony Johnson in this one. Got to go with Rumble, um, but certainly can't discount Clover. He's He's been looking good lately, and yeah, I certainly agree with you. I really I think the winner of this fight definitely gets the next title fight, no matter who it is. I mean, Clover... He's been able to string the wins together. Um, so I really, I don't know. There's the, there's nothing else off the top of my head that would make more sense um, than the winner of this match getting the next light heavyweight title fight. There's there's no real clear contender that I can, I can recall besides those two. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um... That it's definitely a fight, you know. It's you know like that uh, UFC two hundred one fight, just a couple of dudes both who can throw hard as hell. I mean, this is this is a fight truly, you know. When 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 everyone says a fight's gonna get stopped early, it usually goes the distance because both guys are very cautious. But I think this is a fight that truly will get stopped early because they both can throw. Um. So yeah, this uh, Misha Tate, Ron, Ronda Rousey, you know, we try and keep most of the gossip off of the show, but I thought this was an interesting story, which, you know, we we all know about the feud between Misha and Ronda Rousey. Uh, Misha Tate was just on the ever-popular Joe Rogan experience and tells a story about Paige Van Zant meeting Ronda, um, which Paige Van... Van Zant has already confirmed, so uh, it has been con confirmed as true. And if it is true, which it seems like it is, uh, Ronda Rousey is an absolute psychopath. Here, let's uh, listen to the audio. Right, you know what she did to Paige? What? <laughs> so Paige was also at that VIP party, and Paige and I have spoken. We're, we're friendly, but don't know her that well. But anyway, she felt the need. She came up to me. She's like, Misha, Misha. She's like, I have to tell you this experience I had with Ronda. I'm like, oh, what? And she's like, well, we were at a Reebok deal just, you know, recently. And um, she, she's like, we were at a shoot. And she's like, I was trying to find her so we could get a picture. And the Reebok people were like, don't ask Rhonda for a picture. And she's like, why? And she's, they're like, just don't. do, Just stay away from Rhonda. Don't ask. We're having loading issues here. I do apologize. Here, let's see if I refresh the page. You know what she did? Ask Rhonda for a picture. Just here we don't. go. Do, just stay away from Rhonda. Don't ask her for a picture. She's like, okay. And I guess Rhonda came later that day and like seeked her out and just like cussed her out. And, like they've never really had a conversation either. She's like, I don't know Rhonda. Like 
you know, other than hi bye. That's it. Like I guess she came up Rhonda came up and was like, Fuck you, you fair weather bitch. How dare you cross me? Blah blah blah. She's like, cross you? What are you talking about? And she's like, You congratulated Holly Holm for beating me. So fuck you, you fucking fair weather, hundred and fifteen pound like it was just like Whoa. went off on Paige. And Paige came and told me and I was like, Honey, welcome to my world. She's like, Oh my god, she's like, I'm glad that I saw this side of her so I know. You know, I'm like, Well, and she's like, you know, because I didn't understand. She's like, I told Rhonda, like, I'm sorry if that offended you, but you're not know, allowed to congratulate whoever I want. And um, she's like, because, you know, I congratulated Rose Namajunas when she beat me. I was like, you know, congratulations. You whooped my ass. That was a badass performance. And she's like, you know, I just simply told Holly congratulations once. And, like, it wasn't anything, you know, wow. anti-Rhonda. But Rhonda gets just ripped her new one. Wow. Like, you have to be on Team Rhonda for life. Yeah. I guess. I've never been on Team Ronda, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All or none. Wow. Hashtag Team Ronda for life. Um, man, it sounds like uh, there's an implosion of sorts going on with one of the UFC's biggest stars. What did you make of that story? Well, that was that was an interesting report. I mean, really, I'm not one of those people. A lot of people equate Ronda Rousey to having the same personality John Jones does in that one of the best fighters on the planet, but outside the cage, just not very likable. Um, and you know what? I, I don't know what it is, but uh, man, I don't care. I find Ronda Rousey still likable. Um you know, she's she's keeping it 100, as they say. Um, Ronda Rousey, I mean, she will get up in your grill and uh, cuss you out and tell you like it is and not shake your hand after she beats your ass. And, um, you know, uh, she's, she's not the most gracious loser, I would say. Well, actually, I can't say that because she did congratulate holly holm herself on her not the most gracious loser is maybe understatement of the year (laughs) i mean really i think for me i i'm not that bothered by ronda rousey she has the competitive fire she has the competitive drive um social awkwardness maybe you know uh, understandable when you really look at what she's gone through and w- just what her life has been. Um, do I think it's appropriate for her? I mean, yeah, it does sound a little, a little nuts, a little unnecessary, you know, probably reading that, uh, Paige Van Zandt congratulating Holly Holm, probably reading that very wrong. Um, but I also, I, I find issue with why is Misha Tate bringing this up? Misha Tate, I don't know. She bothers me. She's oh, no, of, definitely there's definitely motive there is as, this, as her biggest arch rival bringing up a story that paints Ronda in a terrible light on an extremely popular show. Like, there's definitely oh, yeah. some, some motive there. Oh yeah, Misha just can't wait because she's she's still bitter because she got that ass whooped twice. So she's always, I mean, that's what I have I have way more respect for Ronda Rousey than I do for Misha Tate because when Holly Holm beat Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate's getting on her like, haha, you got beat, bitch, and was so happy because someone did what she never could. And it's just very schadenfreude. It's, she's got the sour grapes. And she just... If, if this were such a big issue... Look at Paige Van Zandt. Paige Van Zandt obviously never felt the need to tell anybody in the media this. Because it's something, you know, Misha Tate just... Or uh, Paige Van Zandt can just brush it off. And say whatever. On to the next. But Misha Tate is just so fucking hung up on Ronda Rousey. She's going on the Joe Rogan experience, which really is, it has to be one of the biggest podcasts in the world and feels the need to tell this story. It's like, yo, that didn't even happen to you. Why are you going around and gossiping? Why are you being the tattletale like a friggin' little five-year-old kid? Like it's, it's, uh, 
I don't know. That's that's the UFC champion. Like that's not your story to tell. Like why are you out there making that public? If Paige didn't want to tell that story to the media, why are you telling that story to the media? And it's it's just funny. She tells her, "Oh yeah, Paige came up and told me the story." Well, yeah, she told you that in confidence. Why would you go run your mouth and and blab like that on the Joe Rogan experience? So, um, yeah, certainly there would be nothing to blab about if if. Rhonda didn't fly off the handle there unnecessarily, but um, I don't know. Not not very well played on on either part of uh, Rousey or Tate. No, but uh, man, Rousey, uh, Rousey, it's it's not been a very good six months of PR for Ronda Rousey since losing to Holly Holm. Uh, I mean, she's really gone from a national darling to uh, kind of now even despised in her own sport. Um, Before we touch on UFC Rotterdam, I did want to also briefly, uh, earlier today, 1FC, uh, 1 Championship 42. Um, Go back and watch those fights if you can because they were pretty fun. Uh, Roger Gracie, uh, getting the belt in a very fun fight. The um, one championships women's anim weight title fight, the inaugural championship fight there uh, between Angela Lee and May Yamaguchi. Lee was a big favorite, but it was a lot closer than folks figured it would be. It was uh, back and forth. Lee ended up winning the decision, but it was a thriller. Definitely go back and watch that if you can. The main event of one championship 42. Um, and I guess let's get to UFC Rotterdam this Sunday's card between Alistair Overeem and Andre Arlovsky, that being the main event. As far as start times, uh, the hold on, I'm pulling it up now. The fight pass prelims start at 10:30 a.m. The fight or the Fox Sports One prelims begin at noon Eastern, and the main card starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Sunday, May 8th. Sunday, not Saturday. Um, I guess you know, man, it's. It's it's honestly been been such a wild week, you know, with finals, and then I traveled down to St. Petersburg uh, during during the break, and actually just got back up to Tallahassee uh, late last night. I haven't really had a chance, like I usually do, to sit down and take this card in fully. Um, I see a lot of names on the prelims. Actually, I recognize not in big fights, but seemingly fights that were set up for them to win uh let's see you got hustam kabalov fighting chris wade that fight uh i would assume yeah who's hustam is minus 200 um what else yan cabral versus reza Medidi. that should be pretty fun kyoji horiguchi uh minus 600 favorite against neil siri uh, you got your boy Bill Gates minus 150 favorite over Olka Sasaki. Um, I guess it's a six card main card or a six fight main card. Three fights on the fight pass prelims. Four fights on the Fox Sports one prelims. Uh, Magnus Sindenblad a minus 300 favorite over Gareth McClellan. So I feel like it's a lot of fights set up to to give people like. Uh, Kyoji and Sindenblad wins uh, going forward. Um, you have anything that you've picked out of the prelims? And honestly, we 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 can probably lump in those those three those first three main card fights. Uh, Carolina Kowalkovitz. It looks like she's getting a winnable fight against Heather Joe Clark. Nikita Krylov gets a winnable fight against Fransimar Barroso. And Jermaine De Random may a winnable fight over Anna Elmos. Um, a lot of one sided tilts here, which is typical for the more global, you know, cards. You 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 wanna give the home country, the home region people, you know, this is in Rotterdam, so you have a lot of Europeans who are getting uh getting fed some wins here um what do you take from all of those and i guess we'll save the 
Gunny Nelson and the main event and co-main event as uh, topics on their own. Yeah, I mean, really, I'm I'm liking the way this card is lining up. I mean, it's it's a uh, got a lot of fights with a 13 fight card and um, pretty well stacked for an international card. I mean, I must say from from the bottom to the top. I mean, there's uh, whoop ass Willie Gates uh, versus Sasaki, Leon Edwards. Um, Kyoji Horiguchi versus Neil Siri. That's gonna be uh, that's gonna be a good one. Neil Siri, he's got some solid fundamental boxing. Will he be able to hang with Kyoji's uh, karate style striking? Uh, Reza Madati, gonna be interesting to uh, to see him back in. It feels like it's been another long layoff for him since we saw his. Uh, his 2015 return to the octagon, but, uh, yeah, he's getting back in there. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely like it. Some, uh, some pretty solid fights here. Habilov versus Wade. I really think that's going to be a solid, solid scrap there. And, uh, yeah, Kov- Kovalkovitz is definitely seems to be getting a nice layup here in uh, in a fight with Heather Clark. Nice little gimme there, sharpening up. Uh, I feel like Krylov Barroso is going to be more competitive. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the gimme. Um, I feel like Krylov may have a little bit of a deficiency on the ground. Um, if, although he does have 12 submission uh, wins under his belt, he does have three submission losses. Um, and our man, uh, Francis Marbahoso, he does have, uh, a few submission victories himself. He's got some good wins, uh, most recently beat Elvis Butopchich and, uh, Ryan Gimo. So he does have a couple solid victories in the UFC that he's, uh, he's riding right now. Um, although Krylov is on a nice little streak himself. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm liking that fight. Um, I like the Iron Lady. I have no clue who Anna Elmos is, but, uh. I'd like to see uh, DeRandome put on a nice little striking exchange. So really, yeah, I, uh, I I feel for an international uh, fight card, this one is is looking pretty nice, fairly exciting. Your your uh, next fight here, Gunnar Nelson versus Albert Tumanoff. Man, one of the most underrated fights of 2016. Honestly, both of these guys, Albert. Tumanoff has strung together five straight wins in the UFC. That's not an easy task. I mean, and 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 the dude is young. I mean, he's what twenty four, fighting out of uh, Russia. I mean, this is this is a guy I I almost want to put in the Max Holloway, uh, you know, group of just super young guys who seem you know aren't aren't just great fighters but it seems like it comes so easily and it's all so just you know it flows he's he he flows very well from grappling to striking he's a uh, you know one of these next generation MMA guys and um man is you know looked very crisp knocking out Alan Joban at UFC 192, took that split decision win against Lorenz Larkin at UFC 195. Uh, and like I said, yeah, he's he's uh, won five in a row since losing his UFC debut to Ildemar Alcantara, a split decision. Uh, Gunny Nelson hadn't lost uh, until his last three fights. He's lost two out of three, uh, losing to Rick Story. Uh, then subbing out Brandon Thatch at UFC 189, and then losing to Damian Maya at UFC 194. Um, man, who I'm picking here? This is close. I, you know, I I could see either fighter winning it. I think uh, Tumanoff maybe a little bit better striker. Um, you know, Gunner is a better striker than I gave him credit for. Uh, in the past, but at the same time, I think Albert's just just better at working angles and moving around, and um, and uh, really just uh, just moving and striking and even defending too. I think Tumanoff probably a little bit better, um, and I think has the defensive skills to keep it standing. Obviously, I don't think he wants to go to the ground with a guy like Gunnar Nelson, who yeah, he did. Sort of get uh, get smacked down by Damian Maya on the ground in his last fight, but that's 
Damian Maya. That's like the best grappler in the sport. So I think Nelson still has a sizable grappling advantage against pretty much anyone that the UFC can give him who's not named Dam Damian Maya. Um, so I guess the question here to me is, can Nelson get it to, to the ground and get Tumanoff in some precarious spots? I think the answer to that's no. And I'm taking an Albert Tumanoff decision here. Uh, tuning off the favorite in Vegas at minus 185. Uh, who are you taking? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know Gunner's my boy. He uh, he does have the all-around skills. He's got more of a karate style with the striking, uh, more measured approach. You won't find him standing in the pocket trading bombs. Um, he's, he's very measured with his approach, and he does have that strong grappling acumen. Tumanov, um, I'd say he he definitely has um, kind of more the Taekwondo style. He throws just he th he throws phenomenal strikes. He's a he's a fantastic mixed martial artist. Um, I feel like he he fights with more pressure than Gunnar Nelson. Uh, Gunnar Nelson, I find, is more of a counter fighter. Uh, Tumanov, he's a guy that is not uh, adverse to coming straight forward at you, and um, I mean figuratively speaking. And, uh, and and hitting you with everything but the kitchen sink. I think, as you mentioned, will Nelson be able to get it to the ground? Certainly that would be where he holds the biggest advantage. And, man, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, because I think his striking is good enough to not get knocked out. And... Depending on what Tumanov is throwing there, who knows? Nelson may be able to jump in with some strikes of his own, or perhaps um, some some sort of sweep to get Tumanov to the ground and work his position there. It's it's a close fight. Both super good uh, prospects in the 170 pound division. Both uh, both are pretty young. I want to say I I I want to say Gunnar Nelson is. No older than thirty, possibly still in his twenties. Um, although I'm, I'm just completely speculating here. Um, man, both both have a, a bright future and are, and are top talent in the welterweight division. But I got to go with my boy Gunnar Nelson. I just think he has a little bit more in the grappling department, and you know you got to have all as many tools as possible. He's just got a little more, so I'll, I'll ride with my boy Gunny. Yes, sir. You're taking Gunnar Nelson in a fight that I think should be the co-main event because we, we go from Tumanoff, who's won five in a row, and Gunny, who has only lost two fights in his entire career, to Antonio Silva and Stefan Struve. Both of these guys have lost three of their last four. You have Silva, who lost, who got KO'd by Arlovsky, KO'd by Frank Mir, then TKO'd Soa Pileli, and then got KO'd by Mark Hunt. And you have Stefan Struve, who got KO'd by Mark Hunt, KO'd by Alistair Overeem, uh, then defeated Big Nog via decision, and then lost to Jared Rocholt by decision. So they share Mark Hunt beating him up. Um, they don't share the Overeem match, uh, Bigfoot, I guess eight fights ago, seven fights ago, KO'd Overeem, uh, where Reem more recently beat Struve, but I think those are two different Reems we're talking about. Back when Reem got KO'd by Bigfoot, he was definitely in a lull, and, uh, Reem seems to have woken up on this streak he is on recently, but, um... I don't know, neither one of these guys seems to be able to crack that top five of the division. Seem to get knocked out pretty impressively when they attempt to do so. Um, but this is interesting, you know, b both of them also show flashes of brilliance. You know, you have Struve with that crazy reach, and his his wrestling's good, his jujitsu's good. 
Um, you have Silva, you know, who's just a beast. That that strength. Once he gets on top of you, it's pretty much game over. He's 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 gonna ground and pound and finish it. I could see this going either way. Um, man, I I I really could see it going um, for either guy. Um, I'll pick. I'll pick Bigfoot Silva to rock Struve and then gets on top of him and finishes it. Uh, one thing which has been throwing me off is crazy. Silva's always sort of rocked the bald look and has grown his hair out, and it just looks so weird to see like a like a I don't know what what to uh, call it, but I mean the dude's got a nice set of hair on him, and you would think as a guy who's been bald his whole career, maybe you know he just just had a bad head head of hair, but uh, you know I I I don't know if uh, it's a hair transplant or if it's his 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 real hair, but uh, you know props to big Bigfoot for for uh growing out his mane he's got a big beard now too it's it seems like it's a different person but uh i will take the underdog here bigfoot silva uh wobbles struve gets on top and then finishes it from the top well you know what and you bring up a good point that uh bigfoot silva has a beard now so I mean, by virtue of that, I think I, I'm just going to have to go with the uh, Bigfoot and his beard. Yeah. This, uh, I, I say that jokingly just because uh, it, Stefan Struve, I don't know that I've ever accurately predicted that outcome of a Stefan Struve fight. You never, ever know what's going to happen with this guy. Um, uh, I think maybe I predicted the Travis Brown knockout correctly. Maybe. Um like you mentioned, though, both of these guys are one and three in their last four. Um, you never know which version of either guy is going to show up. I mean, Stefan Struve at one point knocked out Stipe Miocic, and Miocic is about to fight for the title here. I mean, Stefan Struve was, was putting together a solid little streak. He did show um, grappling proficiency. But he is just, he's seven feet tall, but he fights like he's the shorter guy or something like that because he just has never really put that reach to good use. He's always let people inside to crack on him. Uh, I want to say Roy Nelson and Mark Hunt, who are both like six foot even slash maybe like 5'10", 5'11", both knocked out the seven foot tall Stefan Struve. I mean, it's, it's called a jab. Um, Stefan does not particularly fight long. Um, he does. I mean, those long limbs can be some good weapons on the ground when he does get the opportunity and having that seven foot frame. That's also a, a big advantage to keeping someone down once you get them down. But man, um, Bigfoot, Obviously, given his moniker, no small guy himself, 6'4", um, just just a, a massive individual himself, and probably, I dare say, I mean, of course, I'd say easily has just as good grappling as Stefan Struve, if not better. Bigfoot um, is one guy that can certainly hang with Stefan Struve on the ground, Um I think it really comes down to comes down to the feet here, and oh my goodness, um, I don't know. As I mentioned, we've seen much smaller guys get inside on Stefan Stroop and and finish him. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, but oh, both of these guys are so up and down. I, I just have to flip a coin. You know what? Uh, I'll say I'll say Stefan Stroop comes through with a knockout somehow. Picking Stefan Struve for the KO, and that brings us to the main event. Uh, apparently, a little, uh, a little, um, a little bad, bad water here. Uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Bad blood, not bad water. What the fuck? Um, apparently, Overeem asked for this fight against Arlovsky, and Arlovsky's kind of butthurt about it. Says, you know, yeah, that that puts our coaches Greg Jackson and Mike Winklejohn in a spot. In my opinion, it's not right," said Arlovsky. 
Um, says it's now personal and he will never spar or train with Overeem ever again. Absolutely not. He said when asked about the possibility, absolutely not. No. Um, sounds like he's a little butthurt here. Sounds like he doesn't necessarily want this fight. Um, you know, Andre was on a crazy six fight winning streak. And then got TKO'd by Stipe Miocic earlier this year at UFC 195 in Las Vegas. Uh, Alistair Overeem is on a three-fight winning streak. Uh, lost to Ben Rothwell back in 2014. Since then, uh, wins against Stefan Struve, Roy Nelson. I almost said Hoy Nelson. Uh, Hoy Nelson and Junior Dos Santos. Um, this will be a fun fight. You know, Both of these, these guys seem to be on somewhat of a title track. Um, if I check the UFC rankings, where are they at heavyweight? You, you obviously have the champion Verdum. He's going to be fighting number two, Stipe. Uh, yeah, and you have Kane at one, Stipe at two, Alistair at three, Junior at four, and Andre Arlovsky at five. Reem just beat Junior. Um, so you would assume a win here by Overeem. Puts him up uh, next to the winner of Kane versus Travis Brown as far as who gets the next title shot. Um, Arlovsky might need to rattle off more than one win if he wants a title shot just because he just lost to Stipe at UFC 195. But this is an interesting matchup. You have both guys who seem to have fragile chins at times but maybe not you know i've 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 said on previous shows that the problem with on andre arlovsky wasn't a bad chin it was that he was getting hit with shots that anyone would get knocked out with cuz his hands weren't up you know and in losses to fedor rogers karatonov it wasn't the fact that he was getting put down with soft punches in fact it was the exact opposite he was getting knocked down with punches that would have knocked out anybody just he didn't have his hands up and guess what since those losses he has not gotten KO'd or TKO'd since, with the exception of that recent Stipe fight. Um, Overeem, you know, he his his chin was under great question when he lost three of four, uh, all by KO to Bigfoot Silva, Travis Brown, and Ben Rothwell. But you know, since since go, going over to Jackson's, uh, like I mentioned, those three wins against Stefan Struve, Hoy Nelson, and of course that giant win against Junior Dos Santos. Um, man, I want to say a lot of people who pick fights put a little bit too much bias into a fighter's last match which if i did that you know our our lovsky got tko'd by stipe in less than a minute and overeem beat one of the best fighters in the game and junior dos santos in two rounds um so i hate to put too much bias on that but just the more i think about it you know reem has more tools in his toolbox of striking you know he has he has the clinch he has the knees he has the kicks where Andre uh, really sort of relies on his hands a lot more than Overeem does. Um, hmm. I think it's going to be a stand-up fight. I think it's going to be a finish. And I'm taking Alistair Overeem, uh, the favorite in Vegas, by a matter of minus 240 to Arlovsky's comeback at plus 200. Um final topic before we close out UFC 1 or UFC TMP 167 uh who you got Man this is going to be an epic main event here Arlovsky versus Overeem I can't believe they haven't fought before two veterans that have been in the fight game for so long That's so true And uh man here we go um and I want to say this is this is pretty close um. Well, I, I want to say uh, the, this is a, 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 at least a part of the country that both gentlemen are are fairly familiar with. Um, UFC breaking open a, a new market here, and my goodness, this is this is going to be a, a solid heavyweight fight. Um, like you, Jake, I definitely think this is this is going to be a striking battle. 
But I do think Arlovsky's hands may um, give Overeem more trouble than than some people think. I mean, my goodness, we've seen Overeem get knocked out a few times by people that we did not think should be knocking him out. I mean, Travis Brown. I mean, all the guys, Ben Rothwell. Um, I know myself, I thought uh, Overeem really should be knocking those guys out fairly handily. And he here here we go. We saw him get knocked out a couple times there. Um, and Arlovsky, I mean, he is a powerful puncher. Always has been. Has always had devastating knockout power. Um, I think this one could go either way. We've certainly seen an Overeem turned around. I believe we can attribute that, uh, you know, in addition to listening to the advice on the MMA podcast, um, he's also been with Jackson Winkle John. I want to say that was at the at the start of his turnaround um, and his three fight win streak. Um, Arlovsky, um, I want to say he's he's fairly new to Jackson Winkle John as well. Maybe um, I want to say they arrived at, at a fairly similar time window. Um, and yeah, the, the added drama of the now teammates fighting each other, um, man, this is, this is going to be an interesting fight. I think, um, I, again, this is one of those ones where you think, man, you know, this is going to be a striking battle over Reams, the striker K one Grand Prix champion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but man, you can't discount Arlovsky. It's, it's the styles that make fights. Um, and you know, I think uh, I think I'm gonna go with Arlovsky to to win this fight. I really do. I I don't think he's gonna let Overeem bully him. He may fight with a with a little bit of a sense of urgency. And uh, yeah, we did see Miocic drop Arlovsky in a fairly quick fashion in his last fight. But again, um, yeah, Miocic and Alistair Overeem, very different fighters, and I, I think uh, I think Arlovsky will will be able to hang with that Overeem. I mean, again, Overeem is also a competitor that has similar miles on him as uh, as Andre Arlovsky. They've both been in the game for a long time. So, um, although Overeem is riding that three fight winning streak, as far as miles go. They're both right there, and I think Overeem or uh, Arlovsky knows if he charges Overeem, um, he he can uh, he can reach out and, and touch him and, and shut him down. And uh, I think I'll I'll go with Double uh, A to uh, to do just that to put down uh, Arlovsky with a, a KO. You got Arlovsky going down uh, with the KO. Uh, or no, 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 no. That... Uh, over him, over him. I think I said AA to put down our losses. <laughs> no, yeah, but that's what I meant. Him going down, him actually physically going down, falling to Alistair Overeem. And you know what? We're going to end this edition of the MMA podcast with a little bit of Prince. It was a fucked up few weeks off in uh, a few different veins. You had all that crazy Connor stuff. We uh, we lost a lot of folks in pop culture and even the sport. We had this senseless story coming from Florida with Jordan Parsons. Uh, definitely thoughts and prayers to all his uh, friends and family. China died. Rest in peace to jo- Joni Lara and of course Prince Rogers Nelson. We lost him. Um, man, life is uh, its short. It's fragile. Tell the people you love that you love them because you're not going to be around forever. We got deep all of a sudden. Pat, where do we find you on Twitter? Let's uh, salvage uh-huh. it. Let's, let's end it on a light note. Well, Jake, you can find your boy, Jean-Luc Pimpard, a.k.a. P-Money, a.k.a. Mild Cheddar, at Sweet Happy Jones on Twitter. Uh, You can find me talking about the 162 Dodgers games. We'll be talking about those every day. Uh, Of course, chopping up the MMA news, talking to the MMA podcast fam. Always lovely doing it with you, Jake. Uh, Big shouts out to you and all the... All the MMA podcast uh, co-podcasters and listeners out there. All the fans. Yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we appreciate you t- tuning in. Well, once again, we apologize for the time off. We uh, do plan on bringing it to you every single week. 
Uh, so tune in next Wednesday. We'll we'll uh, try and fit it in like we usually do after UFC tonight. Uh, as always, follow us on Twitter at the MMA Podcast. We love the ever living shit out of each and every one of you. Tweet us. Until then, until next week. <laughs>